the Ask Historians podcast. Hello and welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. On this episode, we are joined by Tyler, DGBD on the subreddit, who is a fellow moderator, and we are here to talk about banjos. Now, we have not discussed in any detail how we're going to structure this. This is an experiment in open form content, so uh, I'll leave the beginning of the discussion up to you. Yeah, so uh, the the first thing I, sh I should say, first of all, thank you very much, Jeremy, for uh, uh, coming in and, and interviewing me. And um, if anybody plays the banjo, uh, they probably are the only people who look at my username and think, uh, oh, I know what that means. Most people think that it's uh, just kind of a string of random letters. But in fact, DGBD uh, is uh, the, the four non-drone strings of the banjo. Um, which is really uh, is an instrument that I really like playing. It's an instrument I've played for a long time, and that's my personal attachment to the instrument, which is uh, that that I love it. I love to play it. Um, I go out busking, you know, playing on the street with it a lot, uh, play a variety of different music on it, and um, it is a really fascinating instrument, uh, which is why, and specifically uh, the 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 history of the instrument has gone through a lot of interesting twists and turns, uh, which is why uh, I would, uh, you know, decided to, to come on here to talk about it. So, yeah, DGBD, if you ever see that, that is the uh, four non-drone strings of the banjo in a, in a general standard tuning. There are a lot of different tunings, but that's one of the most popular tunings. Um, I don't know why I didn't include the drone string. I, I, my guess is that it was already taken and I just went with the four strings that you normally uh play uh you know uh fret but uh yeah that's uh, that's i guess where i'd uh, i'd start in introducing the topic the other thing that i'd like to say and this is sort of the academic reason so that was the personal reason but the academic reason why the banjo is uh so interesting to me is because of uh the interest that i have in folk music and traditional music and Really, when we talk about folk or traditional music, however you know, however you want to put it, uh, what we're talking about is is kind of a a narrative. It's it's a story we tell ourselves because there's been music played for millennia by various people, various kinds of music, and um, a lot of that is kind of classed under what you'd call popular music. Like today, we have you know popular music that's just music that is popular. I mean, it's it's pretty <laughs> easy to define that. If it's popular, it's popular music. Um, folk music has the added element of telling us something about ourselves, or at least that's, that's how we define it. So, so Irish music, um, I've played a lot of Irish music that we feel like that has an inherent quality in it that, that says something about Irish identity, that says something about Ireland and its people. Um, and it's something that uh, is wrapped up in ideas of identity and authenticity. We think that, you know, some aspect of authentic Irish culture involves an aspect of authentic Irish music. Um, what that is starts getting into how we, we talk about um, folk music. And it's easy enough to, to, to say, see someone throat singing to you know mongolian throat singing and um they're playing an electric guitar and most of us would would look at that and we would say ah aha th there's the traditional mongolian throat singing that's authentic that's genuine that's real and then uh, he's playing electric guitar and, and obviously i mean genghis khan wasn't riding around with electric guitars so so that must not be authentic that must not be genuine um that that's an easy sort of mindset to be in and that's where a lot of people are in you you're, you're trying to parse what is authentic what is maybe new and different um and inherent in all of that is this idea that the kind of the, the end result of that is this idea that we have these primordial wells of of music and of tradition that that, that exists somewhere that the most pure essence of that music um, and that, that's what everything is kind of tapping into. Um, so there, there's some primordial, uh, quintessential Irish well that, that everybody who plays Irish music is tapping into. And it's that search for that, that primitive, the, you know, uh, sense of, of the, the 
pure essence of a folk music that has driven a lot of um, research into folk music and traditional music. Now, the issue with all of this is that, that we didn't just have folk music springing up in these, you know, out of these sort of primordial wells all over the world. Culture, music, everything is tied up in an ever-changing population of, of people, ever-changing culture, society, customs, everything. There is a lot, even in music, that seems so inherent, so uh, it, like it's been somewhere for uh, such a long time, unchanging. It's, it's generally a lot of change and, and a, lot of, um, a lot of influence from the outside, from the inside, um, that happens. And so this idea of this primordial well, which has driven so much thought uh, of uh, music, not just in terms of academic thought, but you'll get it in nationalist thought, people who are trying to uh, uh, use music as a, a symbol of their national identity, their ethnic identity. Um, you'll get a lot of people who are just well-meaning, who, who it's not a a conscious thing, but again, they're looking for this sense of uh, of of true authenticity. Um, that's really a story we tell, and it's not really the, the the correct story. And the banjo is actually the I'll say the perfect. It, it's a great example of that because for most people in America. It is the symbol of one of those primordial wells, which is the the Appalachian Mountains and this idea, this hillbilly playing the banjo on his front porch step is this primitive, uh, quintessential American experience. Um, what's funny about the banjo is that actually, if you go back in history, it's it's been uh, that kind of uh, primordial well in many different uh, concepts. And in very different, you know, uh, very kind of divergent concepts. So, for example, uh, before it was the hillbilly on the front porch step a la Deliverance, um, it was the, uh, the, the, the slave on the plantation who uh, was happy-go-lucky and playing the banjo. Um, and that was another stereotype long associated with the banjo. Um, and again, part of this primordial sense of a, a primitive music. Um, and so when we're looking at banjo history, what we see is kind of peeling back the curtain of how we create these stories that we tell ourselves um, about folk music and how a lot of those stories aren't really the full picture. Um, because in, in, in actuality, um, the deliverance style hillbilly sitting on his front porch step playing the banjo that's one iteration that's 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 one aspect of the banjo and its history uh but it's far from the only one and it and it's far from the place that that we would start when we are talking about the banjo i think the first thing i want to ask about came quite early on and it's quite technical which is um in the context of banjo what is a drone string and what is a non-drone string? How do they yeah. differ? Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, it's actually. Why don't we just talk in general about about the banjo? <laughs> um, uh, banjo is a uh, you could call it a a, a chordophone or a, a lute. You you have strings. It's like a guitar. You know, um, uh, you generally speaking, when you're playing the banjo, you're you're putting one set of fingers down on the strings, you're, you're fingering notes, and then the other one is strumming or plucking or picking um, on, on the other side. Now, the something that has been used in many, many different instruments throughout the years um, is the concept of a drone, which is a, a note that doesn't change. Um, on the banjo, if you look at a five-string banjo, you can look at a picture of one, you'll see there are four strings that are long, and then there's one string that's kind of like halfway up the neck. Um, the idea is that you tune that string to to a certain um, note. So in in the kind of the, the DGBD tuning that 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 I talked about, that's my username. Uh, that that drone string would then be a G, usually. And um, 
it doesn't change. No matter no matter what you're playing, that string doesn't change. So every time you hit it, it creates the exact same note over and over again. And essentially, what it does is if if you've ever um, if anyone's ever uh, heard a, a bagpipe, Scottish bagpipe, right? You have the uh, the the melody playing, but then you also have these these other notes that are that are not changing. Um, uh, and you'll see when someone's holding a bagpipe, they've got like these three pipes sort of sticking out like a turkey uh, tail out in the back of them. Those are the drones. What it does is no matter how you do it, whether it's with that short string on the banjo or with the um, uh, with the, the drones on a bagpipe, it creates a kind of an accompaniment or a, 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 uh, a sense of a sense of something going on, um, a sense of harmony. Um, besides the melody that you're playing, um, which is on, you know, on the other strings. Um, and you can also be playing harmony on those other strings as well, but there's that drone kind of keeps steady, steady going. Um, and it, uh, it creates a very specific sound. And that's one of the signature sounds of the five string banjo is that, that droning sound. Um, the other signature sound of the banjo comes from the way that it makes its, um, it, it projects, it makes its sound, which is a stretch skin uh, over the body. Uh, it, usually it's a wooden rim for, uh, for the modern banjo. Uh, back in the day, uh, it was often a gourd um, or, or um, something like that, that, uh, that you would stretch a, uh, a skin over. And um, as opposed to, a guitar or violin, which uses this kind of box of wood that resonates. Um, the, the stretched skin um, membrane that resonates when you pluck the strings has a kind of a thinner sound, but it is a fairly loud sound. Banjos are pretty loud. <laughs> they project. Uh, they're very useful like that. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a technique, an instrument making technique that is not um, uh, just on the banjo, you get uh, uh, hundreds of instruments all around the world that that use this similar technique. Um, uh, the uh, the erhu in Chinese music, uh, the uh, the shamisen in Japanese music. Uh, you get the the top shore in um, uh, in Mongolian and, and Tuvan music. There's, there's, there's actually in the kind of Central Asian uh, area. There's a, a whole bunch of um, related instruments like this and in Africa um, where you see a lot of different instruments, uh, the Kora, the accounting that are again, stretched um, skin over in that case, a, a gourd, sometimes a carved wood body or carved wood rim. Um, so it's, the banjo is by no means unique in that, but it's, it's uh, certainly a sound that is the signature sound of the banjo. And so would I be correct in presuming that it is these African precedents that lie behind the banjo as opposed primarily, I suppose, to European influences? And I guess, how far is it one or the other? Is it kind of you know, an existing African style instrument that is adapted, I suppose, to the availability of materials in North America? Is there a blending of styles? Am I incorrect entirely in assuming that the banjo really starts out as, as the product of the transatlantic slave trade? So, so no, no, you're not. And, and this is where we start getting into the interesting history of the banjo. Um, a lot of times I've seen it written. Um, first off, you know, the, the, the banjo's history has been whitewashed considerably. Um, and, and the narratives that bring um, African-American, um, uh, it, it, you know, roots back into the fold have, have really only become a lot more popular, um, uh, popularly known in the past, you know, f few decades. It's, it's um, something that has been a, a real um, uh, push. Uh, you will see it kind of go the other way sometimes, uh, and this is something I see a lot where it's, it says that the banjo is a, an African instrument. Um, it's, it's not really an African instrument. It, it is derived from instruments brought over from Africa, but the problem that I have with, with saying that it's an African instrument is that it, it cuts out 400 years of history. 
um, and and 400 years of people um, who played the instrument, who you know developed the instrument, and who um, created what we now know today as the banjo, which has a lot of European influence, and um, not to mention, uh, you know, has a, a lot of um, elements that have only been possible, um, you know, in the past 100 or 150 years. There's a lot of um, changes that came about essentially because of the, you know, Industrial Revolution and and a lot of that in your modern, you know, banjo, um, which, so you're, you're kind of alighting a, a lot of history by saying it's an African instrument. The other issue that I have with it, though, um, is a more philosophical one, was, which is that I, I think it still treats Africa as a, a, one of those primordial wells, which is which is one of those those tropes that we just you know we we see time and time again. Africa is essentially the you know the country that ever or the uh, the, the continent. Jesus, I got to cut that out. Um, Africa is essentially the, the the continent that everyone goes to for the the primordial and the primitive, which is horribly racist. Um, and so this idea that, well, you know, the banjo is, it really comes from this, you know, primordial African well, um, is one that I'd like to push back on it. It has its ancestors that come over, um, but it is shaped by many, many generations and many centuries here in the Americas, um, by, a lot of uh, African American and you know Black American people, um, by white American people, by by a whole bunch of of, uh, of influences. And by the way, just as an aside, um, the instruments that are over in Africa, because this is the thing that happens a lot, is uh, uh, Bela Fleck, a, a fairly uh, famous banjo player, um, did this whole series like 10, 15 years ago or something like that, where he go he goes over to Africa and he communes with the, you know, the African musicians and, you know, the heart of the, 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 the homeland of the banjo. And again, it, some of that stuff really, you know, treats it as if Africa has just not changed in the 400 years since and, and that the instruments that they're playing and the music that they're playing uh, in Africa is somehow indicative of, of, of the music that, uh, that they were playing there 400 years ago, um, which is, is just impossible. We, we know that. I mean, you know, we know that any music we have, you know, tons of documentation and notation of say Western classical music from 400 years ago. Uh, we know that the way you hear classical music today, um, is very different from how like Bach heard it, you know, 300 years ago. Uh, there's a whole area of classical music that's, you know, historically informed performances trying to figure out what exactly, you know, Bach was hearing um, or, or, or any, you know, any of those composers. So we know that, you know, that, that just any music cannot remain simply static, unchanged for, for, you know, for that length of time and to treat it like it is, um, is again kind of bringing you back into this concept of the, the primitive African Africa as this unchanging um, content. It's it's I, I think saying that it's a product of the transatlantic slave trade is the best way to put it because it's it it is acknowledging the the huge part that Africa played um, and that people from Africa played, but also acknowledging that ultimately the the story of the banjo comes out of Africa and into the Americas, and and that's where it really um that's where the, the story of the banjo as a separate you know and and distinct instrument really begins so to go further on that though I mean, what does make the banjo a separate and distinct instrument um is it uh, a particular combination of features because I mean, the thing you mentioned with the drone string is my impression to some extent is that that comes out of a very sort of European notion of, of sort of the desirability of having a continuous tone somewhere in the instrument or in the music generally. I mean, is that one of the examples where you see this blending of, of kind of what is in, in essence structurally an African instrument, but within a sort of European conception of music, or am I just completely off here? Well, no. So drone strings are drones in general are actually a, a part of music, really everywhere. You know, um, 
when you say everywhere, I mean, I'm sure there's some pockets of, you know, some places where drones aren't, you know, aren't, aren't, aren't a thing. But, you know, you, you see drone strings. And in fact, you know, over in Africa, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, accounting, which is uh, one of the instruments, you know, probably most closely related to the banjo. And actually, in fact, the traditional way of playing uh, the accounting is, is fairly similar to the, uh, one of the traditional ways of playing the banjo. Um, that has a, a drone string, you know, on it. Um, it's it's a fairly uh, common um, uh, concept. Um, in terms of what separates the banjo, I think this is where we can start getting into the the, the actual history of of the banjo. So, um, in the 17th century, we start seeing um, various uh, references, especially it, it, towards the end of the 17th century, to uh, an instrument that that, that it's called the the banza, the the banjar, the, the, this kind of um, instrument that, that we can start identifying as the banjo. It's a it's a uh, sort of lute like instrument with a stretched skin. It's got um, uh, a, a two, three, four strings. You know, any different number of strings. And th this is very important. A lot of people think that an instrument coming over from Africa means that there was someone like physically bringing instruments over. Um, th th that's not the case. Not to say that none of them ever came over physically one went over, but um, with folk instruments and, you know, with, with a lot of instruments in general, you, you don't, you don't just go to the music shop and, and purchase a uh, factory made um folk instrument that certainly wasn't the case then and and for some isn't even the case today um you make it or uh, someone you know makes it um and it's really that knowledge that that has been brought over now what that means is that there's a lot of variation no two are the same because you're never going to have the same um uh the, the the same uh uh materials that's you know the same shape and, and your idea of how to build it is not going to be the same as someone else's so the, there's tons of in the early banjos that that we see from uh mostly from the 18th century um you know that that we have ex you know depictions um and and some examples um there's a fair bit of uh diversity in in that um you're starting to see some of the uh things that suggest european influence uh, a, a flat fretboard is one of them um uh that's usually taken to be, you know, part of this kind of melding of influences. Um, but you see instruments that, again, have two strings, three strings, four strings. Um, uh, they, they have different body shapes, they, you know, um, and you're seeing them all around the Caribbean, uh, around the, the United States, uh, where pretty much wherever there were uh, black enslaved people, you know, brought over from Africa, um, you're seeing this instrument. Um, it's, it's seen in the context of enslaved people and, no, and noted and observed in the context of enslaved people. And it's very important to point out that um, you can see a stereotype forming um, in, the, in the 17th and 18th centuries of uh, black people as very musical, in, inherently musical, and in fact kind of... Um, taken you know or inclined towards frivolity and and dancing and 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 playing and in fact one of the you know uh one of the early indications of the banjo is is in a in this french edict in uh, martinique that's you know talking about um essentially putting restrictions on slaves gathering for you know dances and, and music making um this seems to be rooted in some amount of fact. I mean, you know, there was music making going on. Um, music was, seems to be fairly, have been fairly culturally important um, in uh, many of the, the African societies that, that um, people were coming from and also in these new societies of enslaved people uh, in, in the Americas. Um, but still, it, it, again, very much is a racist stereotype of, of these kind of happy-go-lucky slaves singing while they worked, singing while they, they, they relaxed at night. And again, you know, not, a, it paints them as not necessarily a serious, um, people. Um, and this kind of stereotyping is something that will 
come back time and time again. Um, but the banjo, this instrument, um, also becomes very, uh, very much associated with African people, with the with the enslaved people, um, and this is the the first stereotype that we have of the banjo and the first, again, kind of like primitive sense of, of music making um, that, that we see the banjo associated with. It is this, um, uh, this sort of slave who is, uh, you know, frittering the night away, um, playing the banjo, dancing. Um, and in fact, there's a, a, a painting from, uh, I think, 1785, The Old Plantation, which is a, the earliest... Um, known depiction of a, a banjo in the uh in the americas um and uh it's it's supposedly in i believe south carolina shows a guy playing something very much looks like a banjo um and uh you know there's there's people kind of dancing and and just ha it seems like they're having a good time um and again, painting that picture, um, which cements the banjo as, you know, in its various forms, this concept of, of the banjo, getting back to your question, um, as, ah, that's, that's the, the, the instrument with the skin and the gourd and the strings that the slaves play and that's 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 where we start forming this concept of of what a banjo is and in, in this case it is very much associated with enslaved people uh on, on the plantation you know having their good time what you mentioned earlier is yeah these stereotypes change a lot and and we do eventually i suppose get to the sort of the appalachian hillbilly i think the first thing is before we see a change to whatever the next major stereotype is, I mean, how, in a sense, stigmatized was the banjo as an instrument because of its associations among, well, not necessarily among enslaved people, who, of course, you know, played it regularly. Let's let's not ignore their perspective about right here, but I guess from sort of those higher up in society who claimed claimed positions of superiority. So it's it's not so much. It's not so much um, stigmatized as just not really thought about. It's 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 uh, an instrument that slaves play. That's you know that's that's what it is. It's it's not necessarily um, something that uh, uh, you associate much with outside of that. You do start seeing, and again, you know, once once you get into the the uh, the, the 19th century. Um, with the with the banjo being firmly ensconced in people's minds as this you know this kind of music of the the, the slaves, um, you start seeing white people uh, growing up in proximity to black people, especially in the South, um, who take an interest in playing the banjo, um, and it's not you know, again, it's not necessarily, it's not something where all of a sudden it's in concert halls. <laughs> that, that, that happens much, much later. But you start seeing an interest in this. And again, it goes back to this, the, the, the interest in um, the, the primitive and the kind of, you know, there's a, there's a free sense. When you, when you read these, these accounts, there's often, yeah, this sort of free uh, sense in, in the way that they describe these uh, these enslaved people just you know kind of dancing and making merry as if there are no tomorrow. Again, these are very I need to <laughs> need to drive this point home. These are very racist stereotypes. These are these are stereotypes that are specifically implanted in people's minds um, because they think of the you know the the black person as being inferior, as not having the intellect um, to 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 put them on par with the whites. And therefore, you know, these, these ideas of these kind of free carousing, um, uh, people is, is a, a sense of unseriousness, a sense of, um, you know, they're happy with their lot. They're content. Actually, a lot of people would, would say that slavery was kind of the natural state of, um, black people. Um, 
so the, you know, we can't, we can't divorce any of this. And this, this is an important part of folk music. We cannot divorce any of it uh, from its social context. But we start seeing some white interest uh, in, in the banjo and, and some white interest being expressed. And, and that's in the first few decades of the 19th century where we start seeing a shift. And that, that shift is the rise of the minstrel shows. Um, you want to talk about racism? It's blackface minstrel shows. <laughs> uh, they are racist. Um, they are purportedly um, based on authentic black um, uh, music. Um, it's usually kind of a theatrical production. So it's uh, a lot of them are, are parodies of various things. We've got a parody of Hamlet, for example, um, uh, or using these stock characters. Uh, in fact, Jim Crow. People talk about Jim Crow laws. Jim Crow was was originally kind of a, a, a stock character in minstrel shows um, that ended up giving its name to uh, uh, the the laws uh, that enforce segregation. Um, so y you get these shows that are um, put on by white people that are sort of taking. Um, this idea of the happy-go-lucky slave and turning it into entertainment. Supposedly, um, a lot of these entertainers went to the authentic grounds of the, the slave plantations and they really communed with, again, this sort of this primordial well of music and all of these songs are very authentic and so on and so forth. Uh, they're not. I mean, you know, they're 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 uh, uh, a uh, often written by um, white people. Uh, they're using this kind of you know Negro dialect um, that is very. I mean, it's very offensive to read. Um, you know, it's 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 this kind of uh, uh, pigeon English kind of deal that that is supposedly based on genuine uh, accents of of black people. Um, and they they put on these shows and it's playing to the racist stereotypes that many people held. It is using so that that accent, um, supposedly genuine accent, um, is one way of sort of signaling authenticity. Um, another way is the banjo, which, again, heavily associated uh, with black people. Um, and it's it's. Uh, using the banjo to show, in in part, that it is obviously this authentic expression of black music. Um, and then, I mean, they do the makeup, and it's just horribly offensive, <laughs> um, and um, hugely. I, I cannot impress this enough. Hugely popular, um, not just in the U.S. In Europe, the UK, Ireland, uh, down in Australia, you see minstrel shows. This is something that that kind of blows people's mind. This is much, much later. But the BBC, up until 1978, you can find this on YouTube or you know wherever you get your uh, online videos. The BBC had a they were called the Black and White Minstrel Show. Um, it's a blackface minstrel show and it's like, it's color TV. It's from the seventies and it's like full on blackface minstrel show. Um, it's again, very hard to overstate how popular, um, this, uh, music, these shows were, how enduring a lot of the, uh, tropes that came out of them, the songs that came out of them were, um, if you've ever sung, Oh, Susanna minstrel song uh i've been working on the railroad uh you know jimmy crack corn and i don't care i mean there's if you're an american you you probably sang these songs when you're like a little kid or at camp or something like that there's like there's a very good chance if you can think of a song um that you sung when you were like five years old and you're an american there's, there's a very good chance it was a minstrel song at one point <laughs> um just just hugely hugely um influential uh, and um, the the last thing that that is is very important, the last thing to know about these minstrel shows that's very important 
is that they make claims to authenticity um, with the banjo, with the, you know, the, the dialect and with the, you know, blackface and, and the, the, the portrayals that they have of um, slaves. But they're not, they don't give black people the full credit. And this is where you start seeing the whitewashing of the banjo. It's, it's something that happens in a lot of folk musics. It's a, it's a process that is, you know, sometimes it's racially based, sometimes it's class based. But the, the idea of taking a folk music and refining it and uh, creating something new and, and better out of it is something that you see with the banjo. And uh, there's a guy named Joel Walker Sweeney. Uh, getting back to an earlier question you had, there's a guy named Joel Walker Sweeney, who uh, is a, a blackface minstrel performer who's often credited with creating that drone string, adding that drone string onto the banjo. Now, he didn't do that. <laughs> um, he, he did, but it's part of the mythos of uh, the banjo that, ah, he he learned how to play the banjo from, uh, you know, this this black guy that he knew and, you know, and, and, and got that real authentic, but then he takes it and he makes something better because ultimately um, what the narrative wants is yes, yes, yes. It, it came from black people, but ultimately white people made it better. White people turned it into something useful, turned it into something, you know, uh, that was, that was greater than what came before it. Um, and so this is where you start seeing, the shift where yes they're they're playing black people they i mean it's obviously it's 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 it it is based on um you know th this idea that this is an authentic expression of african music um but it's still created primarily by white people there there are black minstrels and especially you know uh you know later you you see black minstrels coming in and and it sounds kind of like funny, but they'd actually do them like they're black, but the, 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 some of them actually, you know, they do the makeup, even though they, they were already black. They, you know, because it was a certain way that you'd have to look and it was kind of the minstrel uh, makeup. But, you know, especially early on, this is this is a, um, a a white creation. And by the way, we I'm, I'm in the north um, uh, of the United States. We often like to kind of pass the buck down to the southerners on anything racism related or, you know black and white related, a uh, lot of Northerners. Uh, and it was hugely popular in Northern circles. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's something that uh, we would be, I think, uh, you know, it'd be good for us to fully acknowledge um, that, that this was not, oh, it's just a Southern thing. It's just a problem in the South. It's in fact, um, minstrel shows were hugely popular in the North. A lot of them were, you know, from New York and from, you know, from other places in, in the North. Um, it was even popular kind of oddly enough among many abolitionist, um, groups, uh, who, who saw it as kind of a, you know, it might be patronizing, but it, in, it, you know, many of the portrayals were somewhat positive, I guess, if, if again, you know, kind of, uh, they, they, they were very racist, but people saw them as, oh, you know, they're, they're seeing them in a sympathetic light, um, and and for that, there were some Southerners, some pro-slavery Southerners who didn't like them because they didn't want to, you know, to to see, uh, you know, any kind of sympathetic light um, put on uh, enslaved people. Um, and, you know, there were also people who saw that they were horrifically racist and uh, decried the horrifically racist portrayals in them. Um, and, you know, again, the constant throughout this is is the banjo banjo is is becomes this this enduring uh and and very uh symbol of minstrelsy and very tied up in the concept of minstrelsy yeah yeah no as soon as you mentioned the black and white minstrel show i went oh right yeah no and i know i know where this is going <laughs> not not that i am old enough to remember the late 1970s in the uk but um I knew people who are. Oh, I that's, well, that's that's an an important thing, and, and this is why I, you know, minstrelsy. And I, I'm not gonna. There's there's tons of history about minstrelsy that we just do not have the time to talk about right now. But minstrelsy has a massive legacy. It has a massive legacy in the United States. 
Um, it has a massive legacy outside of the United States. It is, uh, you you could make a very good argument that it is uh, the the first massive American cultural export. So now we're we're used to Hollywood and pop music and all you know all this stuff. We're we're, we're sending out various kind of cultural emissaries constantly. Um, you could make a very good argument that that essentially the, the minstrel shows are the start of that, um, these these big tours that they did um, outside. And also one of the, the first big, you know, popular entertainment, you know, uh, explosions around the U.S. that, that you know, um, uh, formed a lot of the backbone of what would become the entertainment industry uh, in the United States. And, and again, I, I don't think it's overstating it to say that. Uh, and I think a, a lot of people would be very surprised um, when they start delving into the history of whatever it is, <laughs> kind of music or kind of entertainment that they like. There's, there's probably some influence from, from blackface minstrelsy in there. And oh, by the way, we're not that far removed from when people were still, I mean, there are plenty of people alive, you know, your grandparents, possibly your parents, you know, uh, were, were uh, alive, possibly you, obviously, you know, uh, <laughs> depending on the age of, of people listening, uh, were alive to see blackface as a, a, a viable entertainment concept, um, you know, uh, which is, you know, sobering. And it, it, it reminds you that we're not talking about things in, that are completely in, you know, some long distant past. Um. Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid I, I've got to take a quick moment because I I had thought when you mentioned the idea of, of the minstrel show as, a, as this sort of old bit of American mass media that... Um, so in it, there is, I think, a a song in one of the last Gilbert and Sullivan shows, Utopia Limited, that is described as a minstrel show, but where it's kind of a, a parody version, where it instead of you know parody black people, it's a bunch of English aristocrats in sort of court dress doing it. Um, yeah, yeah, no, it's it, yeah, um, obviously. I could I could show you an illustration now because we're speaking <laughs> with with video <laughs> enabled, but um, I don't think the audience would get it. But uh, you know, <laughs> I'd say yeah, it's I I I, I that tracks. <laughs> yeah, and Gilbert and Sullivan coming in at the you know the the, the turn of the nineteenth twenty you know into the twentieth centuries that you know late nineteenth that's sort of at at the um, you know certainly the the waning days of you know the minstrel shows you know huge popularity but that would have been very much on their minds in terms of you know entertainment uh you you'd probably you know i i don't know that much about gilbert and sullivan i'd be willing to bet they saw you know at least one and probably many you know minstrel shows in their day <laughs> yeah no, definitely they they take influence from such a vast variety of stuff that it, it, it's absolutely certain, but I mean, I, I guess we probably ought to move on from the, the minstrel show for now, because what comes out of that? And this is: do we get to the Appalachian hillbilly, or is that still a while away? Yeah, we're, so, so we're getting there. We're getting there. So, so, so we have the 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 the, the middle of the nineteenth century, um, the 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 heyday of the um, of the minstrel show, um, the Civil War kind of sees um sees an end of the the real top end of the minstrel shows although I, as i said that you know they'll last the, the the tail end of that will last for a long long time um and the kind of the next iteration of the banjo and and this is going to sound very very funny um to to people who um uh who think of that uh porch hillbilly um uh, kind of kind of player um is that the banjo starts to sort of see some amount of respectability um it's been hugely popular again the, you know the banjo has been hugely popular and we talked about folk instruments being kind of amorphous kind of you know that people are building them different well we're starting to see some some amount of standardization we're starting to see um, uh, some 
sense of um, both an industrial, you know, people making them on a, on a larger scale. Um, and we're seeing the more common today, uh, you know, wooden rim. Um, we're back in the, you know, minstrel days, you'd generally have like three strings and a drone string. Um, a fifth string gets added um, as well um, in the, you know, later bits of the, the, the 19th century. So, and you're starting to see, again, just this, this standardization and it starts getting, you get these like primer books, how to play the banjo, um, which obviously you need a, a standard instrument in order to do that. Cause you can't, you can't, can't write a book on how to play the banjo if everyone's playing a different banjo. Um, and it actually becomes kind of a society thing. You get like, like society ladies. And again, this is, sounds funny to people who are, um, you know, who, who have this deliverance concept, uh, you know, who these society ladies playing like classical music on the banjo. Um, uh, you get, you know, banjo groups and, you know, ensembles and orchestras. Um, it, it's becomes kind of a, a parlor instrument, you know, for people. Um, it's, it's just a popular instrument and it, and it sees a little bit of a, if not necessarily fully highbrow, although there are, you know, there are people who, who become these sort of banjo virtuosos and who become a, uh, you know, try to take it into highbrow, uh, range, you at least see, you know, a, a kind of a middlebrow, um, acceptance of the banjo. Um, and this is a, a big trend, you know, towards the end of the 19th century. Um, now, a, a couple things to note here, because this is where we start flying off in a bunch of different directions. I, I've been talking, I, I should note that I've been talking about the kind of the main huge currents of, of music. Um, black people are still playing the banjo. Uh, it's still a folk instrument, you know, to, to a, a lot of black people. People around black people, especially again in the, in the South, um, are, are picking up the banjo, sometimes inspired by minstrel shows, sometimes inspired by, you know, the, the black people next door, sometimes both. So there's a lot of folk playing of the banjo as well, um, as there is with every instrument. And this is, again, the thing about folk music is like, it, it, it's, it, as instruments become popular, people just do things with them. You know, uh, accordions, you'll find accordions in tons of uh, musics all around the world. You know, accordions were invented uh, in Germany in the 19th century. Um, so they're not this inherent thing to any folk music. They, they've only been around for 200 years. Um, but as soon as accordions start getting made and start getting distributed, people start adapting them into their folk musics. Um, so you see this. Um, the banjo starts to get adapted itself. One of, one of the outgrowths of the banjo is taking away the, the five-string banjo with the drone and making a four-string banjo um, that is tuned in fifths like a mandolin or a, or a violin or a cello. Um, this is great for melody playing, and it's loud. It's great. You know, like it's, it's really loud. It's really great. And um, in, the, uh, in the early parts of the 20th century, you'll see this used uh, to play ragtime and to play jazz. Um, and even today, kind of traditional, you know, what they call traditional jazz or, or uh, Dixieland jazz bands will have this four-string banjo person you know, strumming along. Um, uh, you also get, I mean, there are various iterations of the four-string banjo. You get a plectrum banjo, which is essentially just a normal banjo, but with the uh, a normal five-string banjo, but with the top string taken off. So again, you don't have a drone string, but you kind of strum along, play melodies and stuff like that. Um, so the banjo gets taken in that direction. The society ladies, um, you know, Trends come and trends go. The mandolin has its has its uh, a day in the spotlight as well uh, around the around the, the 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 turn of the twentieth century. Uh, you know the the banjo uh, gives way to the guitar. You know the, the mandolin. To, I mean trends uh, come and go, and and the banjo is no different. Um, so we start seeing a shift away in in a lot of popular um, circles uh, from from the banjo, um, and and. Because of all this, 
you you know if you're if you're talking about the five string banjo um by the you know first couple decades of the the 20th century um you're as a you know an urban person um you know living in in a city or a town you're less likely uh, to hear the five string banjo the, the minstrel shows are you know not nearly as popular as they once were um but the banjo has taken hold um, in the dance music um, of a lot of different regions, including most, you know, most uh, most prominently in a lot of people's minds in the Appalachian Mountains. Um, you also see it in the, the, the Ozark Mountains, uh, which are over in um, Arkansas and Missouri. Um, really, you see, you know, the banjo all over the place. But, th- but these are the places that are um, most associated with the banjo um, today. And there the banjo is paired with the fiddle and you start getting this music which is influenced by irish and scottish music uh it's influenced uh by the the black music of the area um and and just various um you know various influences from from the mix of ethnicities in the area um you have this music which um eventually gets dubbed old timey music um in part because you know it's seen by uh, the people who are making these labels, who are generally you know urban record you know labels um, who are trying to sell records. Um, they're trying to appeal to this you know to this sense of uh, uh, tradition, and um, you know the banjo kind of seen as old fashioned um, at this point, and so you know old time music the the, the uh, the term that people used as well were hillbilly records. You know, you'd, you'd have these uh, uh, banjo and fiddle recordings. Um, and uh, and there's a big market for these. There's a big, you know, there's a lot of people getting uh, phonographs and, you know, getting. And, and so they're, they're selling these albums um, and, uh, you know, people are buying them up. Um, and again, this is where I just stop and say, we're talking about music that is part of a folk process and there's this is not to glide over the fact that people have been playing the banjo it for their own reasons in their own time their own musics constantly um but in terms of our popular understanding of what that means um these hillbilly records or you know old timey records um is these are really what start forming that deliverance hillbilly hick version of the banjo. Um, these become very popular. They, they morph into uh, what we know as country music. Um, they morph into what we know as bluegrass music, which is a whole other topic of discussion, but just briefly bluegrass music is a, is a professional commercial music. It's based off of, you know, this, this traditional old timey music. Um, but it's, it's played by, uh, professionals. There's a guy, Bill Monroe, known as the father of bluegrass, uh, who had Bill Monroe and his bluegrass boys, which is where we get the, uh, the name, the bluegrass state being the name of, uh, Kentucky, um, the, the, the state he was from. Um, and, uh, and so again, a lot, a lot of people think that bluegrass is, you know, some kind of, traditional mountain music it's it's derived from that but it's very much a, a commercial concept um and because of that banjo fiddle pairing um in that that has sort of gone through this this folk process and and by the way i mean you know the banjo fiddle pairing was also the main pairing in minstrel shows um the fiddle is hugely prominent in um in music Pretty much any kind of European derived music, you're going to find, you know, the fiddle um, in, in in some capacity. Um, it's a you know just very popular instrument in general, um, and so the banjo and fiddle pairing is is one that that you see um, a lot, um, and it it becomes associated with this kind of old time uh, Appalachian music, um, and and that's then through these hillbilly records. Um, and, and this, and bluegrass and the, the musics that come out of that, where we get to this, 
uh, now the 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 banjo is seen as a a white hillbilly instrument. Um, I kind of glossed over this, but um, black people in general they don't completely stop playing the banjo, um, but there is a definite association with the banjo and minstrel music, um, which a lot of, as you can imagine, black people are not keen on. <laughs> minstrel shows are not necessarily super popular uh, in that depiction. That helps um, bring down black uh, uh, banjo playing. Um, the popularity of jazz and the popularity of blues also start putting other instruments um, it, into the mix in terms of um, uh, sort of black music making in in the the U.S. You're uh, more likely to see you know jazz players playing a piano, clarinet, uh, saxophone. You're more likely to see blues players playing piano or the harmonica or the guitar. Um, so that uh, that starts you know. Uh, lessening, you know, thinning the ranks of um, of black banjo players, but you see a, a lot of them. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, you know, with jug bands in the in the nineteen thirties, um, you'll see a lot of um, uh, banjo playing again with um, uh, with jazz bands. Uh, you know, you'll have uh, tenor banjos being played, um, but the shift has has started and and white people have kind of taken over the popular <laughs> conception of the band joe um to the point where um nowadays a lot of people are surprised to learn that that the banjo had anything to do with black music ever um because it's just not thought of um in 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 that sense again you know in popular imagination we're really coming up for time, but I don't want to call things straight away because I did have one little question, which is, because as, as we've talked about, there's a lot of shifts historically in the way that the banjo has been perceived. Uh, we've talked a, a bit about things like bluegrass, which has recent iterations on that. Obviously, this is moving kind of from history to present now, but are there shifts going on at the moment in terms of the banjo? Are there interesting new ways in which it's being used? And are there any particular recommendations, if so? Yeah. So, um, the, the biggest one, um, that, that I can, uh, that I can say is just the, the reintroduction for, you know, I think most people, um, it, to the idea of the black banjo player, um, uh, and that the, the most important, um, sort of, uh, group in that regard, I think you'd you'd have to say is the Carolina Chocolate Drops, who um, are are were I think they're kind of I don't know on hiatus or something like that, but a group of of um, uh, young black musicians who um, actually went and 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 studied with it and uh, older black uh, banjo player uh, Joe Turner down in uh, North Carolina. And uh, started playing black string band music. And again, string band music, of the, the fiddle and banjo kind of sound is very much associated with white um, music. And so the, the Carolina Chocolate Drops are kind of trying to wrest some of that away and to, you know, to, to show the, the black roots of the banjo. Um, they won a Grammy in uh, uh, 2010 with a, uh, an album called Genuine Negro Jig. It's kind of funny because it's, it's black musicians playing a, uh, there was a tune on there, the, the title track called Genuine Negro Jig. It was obviously given that name um, as part of a collection um, that purported that it was in fact, um, you know, genuine um, and, and from black people, uh, but from, you know, from a white person um, so, but, um, the, the, the way in which they're, uh, you know, they're, they're kind of bringing everything full circle and then, you know, playing that music again and playing the music, um, you know, that, that is 
very proudly black and and also you know tied to the banjo and the fiddle. Uh, certainly very interesting. Uh, two of the members of the band, uh, Dom Flemons and Rhiannon Giddens, have uh, gone on to have solo careers um, that uh, you know have have brought them both into prominence um, playing the banjo. Uh, Rhiannon Giddens, I think, was a like a MacArthur, what do they call them, the Genius Grant or whatever um, awardee. She's you know she's become a very kind of uh, popular uh, musician. Um, exploring various roots of, you know, folk musics uh, around the place. So that that's where I would, you know, if, if you were interested uh, in some of the um, kind of newer stuff uh, with the banjo relating to uh, a lot of the, the topics we've discussed, that's, that's where I would start. Um, one thing actually that I did want to get to that um, the Carolina Chocolate Chops kind of brought up is this idea again because they 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 did it too of going to the tradition bearers going to these wells of music and and and, and I do want to make it clear that that I'm not I'm not saying that every instance of that is bad in fact you know you you go to uh people who are part of the tradition to learn about different traditions they, you know that's what they were doing they 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 wanted to learn about black banjo playing they found a guy who was old and he was black and he played the banjo and you know he had a long history of playing it and and they were able to talk to him about that um but that also comes up again in this in creating um uh these narratives throughout the history of the banjo again this idea of going somewhere going down to the slave plantations and you learn from the slaves of how to, of how to play the banjo. And that, that is your marker of authenticity. Now is you can say, I went down and you, you know, you'll see that in the like advertising material and stuff like that. And the biographies of these minstrel performers, I went to, you know, this guy went down and he learned the banjo from such and such a person. It's a claim to authenticity. You'll see that again, um, around the folk revival. Uh, um, in the uh, in the United States, the fifties and and sixties, you get all these guys from the city. They go off into the the uh, you know Appalachian Mountains and uh, you know into the Ozarks and down you know down south, and they they they're going off and they're finding these people. Um, the 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 narratives are you know uh, Doc Boggs was a um, you know he was a banjo player and then he he sold his banjo. Um, and, and he didn't play for 30 years and he, you know, Roscoe Holcomb was a coal miner, like a, you know, true blue coal miner from, uh, from Kentucky. Uh, um, and, and they found him and they found his playing and he was, he was the, 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 um, most traditional and the, you know, the, the, the real kind of heart of the tradition. You see those narratives time and time again it's a it, and and people come out of it now you get people who are you know grew up in new york city um who you know or grew up in places sort of far removed from some of these you know where these banjo styles kind of came up or are, are associated with um that that use that sort of having gone to the well um as their claim to authenticity and it, it's again, it's not necessarily a bad thing. You, you do, you know, you do have to, um, uh, to go and consult with the, you know, the people who carry these various traditions. I think that the one caution that I would have to anybody who, you know, is looking at a lot of these, um, you know, these narratives, you know, um, uh, these musicians is, you know, the Carolina chocolate chops are a great example of people who were, uh, uh, you know, who are very respectful of the tradition that they that they came and, and looked into and have done very well um, to to sort of uh, help foster it. There's a lot of exploitation that comes out of um, a lot of this sort of going to the primordial wells and other people have not done so great a job of fully acknowledging what it is that the traditions that they're taking from, you know, are where it came from, uh, who, you know, who 
uh, what cultures and communities and people, you know, created that tradition and, and have sustained those traditions. Um, and that, that can be very iffy. So, uh, you know, in terms of, I guess in terms of ethical consumption is, uh, you know, what I'd say, you'd, that's something to think about is, is, um, you know, how you approach, um, those, uh, uh, those questions. And again, you know, seeing traditions as something static, as something that's, you know, a sense of the primitive, as opposed to something that's changeable. And that a tradition is different today than it was 50 years ago, and it'll be different 50 years from now than it was now. And that doesn't mean it's not a tradition. Um, it just it just means that people change and things change. Um, and authenticity is very, as we've discussed, um, is a very amorphous concept and can change very, very quickly. Um, and so that's, that's what I'd say to anyone looking to, you know, look at the banjo and we haven't even gotten to, geez, we could go on and on about, you know, we'll do maybe another podcast sometime about, you know, how the banjo got taken up in traditional Irish music and, you know, can do a whole other one about the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, banjo in jazz music or, uh, you know, various, the, the three finger bluegrass style and the evolution of that versus the, the two finger claw hammer style that many people use to discuss the differences between old time and, and bluegrass banjo picking. Um, uh, which is again kind of a narrative more so than you know grounded in in strong truth um but as you say we're <laughs> we're up against it at this point yeah i mean this is not not a definitive history of absolutely everything but i think i hope it, i hope it has been a, a a good introduction for for anyone curious and that we've given a, a good sense of of um what is out there in terms of in terms of the banjo. I mean, I, I don't have to say I, I hope we'll come back on because, I mean, you're here every other week pretty much anyway, just on the other side of the <laughs> mic. Um, but thank you for coming on to do to be on the interviewee side of the mic this time. And, um, well, we'll see you again sometime. Yes, absolutely. And uh, thank you so much for, for interviewing me, for having me. Um, you didn't have any choice because I, I'm, I'm on the, uh, the organizing committee for, uh, these podcasts. So I, you know, probably would have forced my way in anyway, but, uh, but thank I mean, you I for, like, uh, for doing it. I mean, I feel like the organizing committee is the two of us. So. <laughs> 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 but um but yeah um uh, thank you so much and and to everybody you know out there who is uh is interested in the banjo pick it pick one up and 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 play it and and don't get we just had a long discussion about the history of the banjo don't get too worked up about that it's a fascinating history it would be great for you to delve into it but it would also just be great for you to pick up a banjo and start playing it whatever music you like you can i i, I play whitney houston on the banjo when i'm out busking you know among many many other things you can play anything uh so you know just just pick one up and play it um and you know, if, if you have the chance, check out some uh, some of the music and uh, have a think about what it all means. You've been listening to the Ask Historians podcast. Please support us at patreon.com slash askhistorians. Find more history like this by following us on Twitter and Facebook and by visiting us at askhistorians.reddit.com and ask hundreds of historians and enthusiasts anything you want to know about history.